Hi, it's Rick B. Cotter. I want to welcome you to our uh, faculty forum. You know, this is the anniversary. Not a, We would have been in Las Vegas right now doing a boot camp course with our uh, air, uh, our procedure course and our ultrasound course and our pharmacology course. And we would have had a lot of fun being there, but we couldn't be there. So if I asked a couple of the faculty that you have probably gotten to know over the years to participate in a kind of a question and answer thing that we uh, put together, really just as an opportunity to get back together with you. It's been a while and um, and I know that you're working hard out there and that this is these are extraordinarily unprecedented times. And I know that it's right now, um, it's very difficult to work in the departments that, that are uh, seeing a lot of COVID patients. Um, so I do think that this, that you guys are absolutely clearly on the hero spectrum for sure. So let me tell you what we're going to do here. First of all, I want to introduce you to these folks who are here. Uh, you probably know uh, most of them. First of all, uh, Diane Burmammer. Diane is, um, was the residency associate director for 20 years at the Harbor UCLA Emergency Department which is right down the street from uh, where she lives, more or less. And she is, she's written a good number of the lectures that were involved in the uh, original boot camp course. Uh, so Diane is Professor Emeritus there at UCLA as, uh, as well. And then Rick, Rick Pescator. Rick, um, Rick is in South Jersey uh, now. He's the guy with the big mic there. And um, he recently... Actually, was it today or the day before? Received a, a nice kind of like uh, his his political career began. Uh, what what can you tell us about that, Rick? Um, I actually am going to be president of the United States right. Well, now. you got to start wow. someplace. <laughs> We're going to roll that right now, huh? It's amazing. Well, um, you're uh, first uh, local office, nothing, nothing Look, tremendous. Your county commissioner. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I won the primary for uh, um, township committee, so really big. Look, deal. if you want, if you wanted to be God, you should have just become an interventional radiologist. Come on, Rick is um, um, an emergency physician, and it's also I have to read this properly because I don't want to make any any mistakes here. Hold on here, chief physician, chief physician, Delaware Division of Public Health and an assistant professor at Drexel uh, Medical School. Now, I got to tell you, uh, Rick, chief physician has to go. We no longer call people chiefs anymore. That's out. <laughs> so that name, all of you who are chiefs of your department, that's out. Uh, you have to come up with a different name. Uh, I'm going to go with by Diane Birnbaumer of my of Division of Public Health. It's that's too hard to say. <laughs> you need a shorter name, something easier. Ken Milne, the blonde guy there um, on my screen in the center is coming to us from uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, he's chief of staff at uh, Huron Hospital, South Huron Hospital. And he's been chief of staff there for a long, long time. About mm, maybe eight or nine years now ago. Oh, he, it's, it's. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to a different topic now. It, it's like a sentence, not a, not a term. <laughs> Yes, who's next to be chief of staff? Ken, you haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, about eight or eight or nine years ago, Ken received the Cape Education uh, Education Award, uh, which is a kind of a, a big deal in Canada. And last year, he won the um, ASIP Education Award, which is even a bigger deal. And there, and I, and congratulations, Ken. Your podcast, the Skeptics to Emergency Medicine, has reached to you know, 20,000 people tune into you uh, every week as you review the literature and um, do a fine job on that. Yeah, somebody has to review the literature now. Um, Mike Sharma. Mike is a PA extraordinaire, was uh, in Afghanistan as a PA, frontline kind of thing, trauma management, working in Dallas. What the heck? <laughs> Just mixing it up a little bit, trying to keep it light. Um, uh, like Dallas you, you metro to, area, uh, um, doing his thing in the emergency departments there in urgent care centers. And uh, last but not least is uh, Martha Roberts. Martha is an NP extraordinaire. She has at least, honest to goodness, she has about 15 initials after her name. Uh, she is now in uh, at UC Davis where she's working with... Um, the residents and the doctors in their emergency department there. She's been there about um, six months, Martha. 
That's right. Yeah. And it's a great place to be. I know you have some really great mentors there. So I have, I have to thank you all for coming tonight and spending your, uh, your time with us. Martha's going to run with the ball. And just as she do has done in the courses, she's going to be our moderator. She's going to kind of field the questions. And you're, she's going to tell you how you can send in questions uh, tonight or comments uh, to join in the conversation. So Martha, take it away. Yeah, so someone's got to keep all you guys in line, right? You know, or else it's going to get out of control. But the good news is, is that we, this is our first faculty forum ever that we've been doing virtually. And we are going to be answering all sorts of questions, anything that you want to ask. That's the good news. Um, but the bad news is we are a little disappointed that we can't be with you live, but we're going to make this the best that we can. Um, if you're, if you're new to our CCME gang, basically, if you want to hear more about our courses, you can go to ccme.org. And you can look at our courses for NPs, PAs, doctors, um, board review, critical care courses. We have all kinds of stuff. We go to all different places. Hopefully that will come back soon. In the meantime, we've got lots of virtual other stuff and courses you can learn from. But let's discuss right now how you're going to be able to ask questions and how this is going to work. So basically, we have some pre-submitted questions that were provided to us over the last couple of weeks. And they're very good questions. I'm, I'm actually excited to bring some of them up. Um, in addition, if you'd like to ask a question in real time, super simple. All you do is go to slido.com. And that's just www.slido, S-L-I-D-O.com. And when you get to that page, it will ask you for an event code with a little hashtag. And you simply put in our event code, which is E M. BC faculty forum and push enter. You can create a profile for yourself if you'd like everyone to know who you are, or you can remain anonymous. And when you get there, you'll see all the questions. Um, certainly uh, nothing is off limits. I, I wanted to actually jump right into our first question by saying one thing. Uh, David Pecora, who asks great questions all the time, asked us to give us some updates on the COVID-19 from the emergency medicine perspective. Um, that could go a lot of different ways. We are going to cover some of this, but a little bit later in the Q&A. The first question I want to get to, you know, we're all still practicing bread and butter stuff, anything that walks in through the door. We have, you know, fractures, dislocations, uh, diabetic issues. We've got, uh, all kinds of wounds, urgent care. You guys are seeing, you know, medication refills and people that want work notes, all kinds of stuff. So I wanted to open up the discussion today by answering our first question in regards to using dissolvable sutures on the face or not. Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> well, we're we, supposed we, to moderate us. Who, who's who's well, going to go first? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we. <sighs> Listen, sewing on the face is like a little bit different than sewing everywhere else in the body. I think that that's important. There are huge aesthetic considerations. So I think that the calculus when you talk about sewing on the face um, is a little bit different than sewing on the leg or sewing on the back. So I do think that that's important. Um, I use absorbable sutures on the face. And I, I think that we are really very rapidly approaching a world, if we're not already there, that we have to give fairly serious consideration about when we should use non-absorbable sutures at all. I, I think that it should almost be uh, the exception, if not the rule. So I, 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 that's, that's my perspective on it, that the overwhelming majority of suturing that I do is with absorbable sutures because of overwhelming, continuous, constant evidence of minimal disparity in infection rates and uh, outstanding uh, cosmesis any way you go. And if I can save somebody a trip back to my COVID-laden facility to get those sutures removed, isn't that a benefit? So actually, that's really good advice right now, being the fact we don't want people to come back unless they absolutely have to. It's not that we don't care or we don't want to do extra stuff for them, but you're right. Having to come back to the ER right now is a dangerous place to be. So I'm with you on that. Well, it's kind of interesting in the uh, LA Times, full page ads, all the major health systems in Los Angeles basically are saying it's okay to come back to the emergency department because their sentences have dropped so precipitously that uh, they're having to 
ask people to come back. Yeah, but Rick, that's a different thing, right? That's this. There's a difference between what's better for the patient to do. Do they even need to be there versus, my God, we don't have any business. Although, I'll, I don't know, our emergency department is out of control and has been for about a week and a half now. No. So it is full on back and then some. Yeah, I personally think that uh, I would li- like not to have the patient have to come back to anybody, whether they have to go to their family doctor. You know, a lot of the doctors don't have the instruments to take out stitches and those kinds of things. And so I think it's it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, I worked in an emergency department for 25 years where we took out our own stitches. And so we were able to uh, monitor the wounds. We, do, we did the burn dressing changes. We did all those things that I didn't think would be really well done by the family doctor or the family internist or, or certainly the family pediatrician, uh, not to slight them, because that, but that's not what they do. So I thought we did a better job at it. We did all the INDs. We followed them all, um, and we took our st- st- stitches out. So the issue of having not to come back at all was a little less where I was because we would take care of it. And But I think that from a practical point of view, um, I think that the idea of having stitches that you don't have to take out is pretty cool. Rick, did you charge twice? Uh, usually, when you suture, put sutures in, the, t- the t- takeout fee is basically included in the put them in fee. If the patients go to the same facility. Though. Right. right. And, they, and, and they came back. And we asked them to come back. We, we told them to come yeah. back in three days. And you know, we I, asked I, them I, to go come back in the morning, preferably when it would be lighter to get them in and out. I was working urgent care the other day and I had plenty of people who came in for suture removal that weren't placed at my facility. And it's often a surprise to them that it's a completely different facility fee and a completely different visit fee. And, you know, that, that continues to go into my uh, evaluation here of why didn't they have absorbable sutures in to begin with? Yeah. I think that there's an ethical issue about having people go unnecessarily for follow-up care and follow-up care is expensive. Well, so let me get back to the expensive part of this because, um, I had a bad experience with dissolvable sutures myself and I'm, I'm going to share my scar right here. If you guys can all see it, I wore the shirt on purpose. This is my keloid right here. And that is because I form keloids, uh, more frequently than other people for whatever reason. And I had dissolvable sutures for my, uh, surgery that I had. And I had lots of complications and lots of bills after this because of this. I've had to see plastic surgery specialists. I've had to do injections, all kinds of things. And, you know, uh, coming back, you know, to get sutures removed, there's some literature that shows that the dissolvable sutures can produce more keloid formation. And if, you know, if I had known that, you know, I would have made sure that I had gotten removable sutures and done my follow-up worth the money in the long run. Well, I, you know, I, push back on that a little bit to say that, you know, I, I think that would. I would, that's what I do. Um, you know, we, we've all seen this, I want to call it bench research a little bit of, uh, the inflammatory potential of, uh, absorbable sutures and particularly multifilament absorbable sutures as compared to monofilament, non-absorbable sutures. But there, there are plenty of data sets, even in the pediatric population, um, where you would expect to see more of a sort of a brisk inflammatory reaction that does not show any profound difficulty in cosmesis, but also, you know, we, there's plenty more to talk about, about wound care and, and functional cosmesis after completion of, um, suturing, whether it be, what are you putting uh, a certain type of cream on top of it? Are you covering it with a bandage and for how are long? Are you blaming and- me for my suture <laughs> failure? That would be keloid blaming. Wouldn't I think it? it's called keloid contributory blaming. negligence. Wow. <laughs> but you Can know, I-, I, I think, I think the, the point is it, it, it's important, right? I, I do think you bring up a very important point, which is you have priorities. There are things that are inherently purposeful and more important to you and your risk benefit and uh, pro con analysis is your own analysis. And and that's something that the uh, Mm -hmm. provider has to respect. And that's a conversation. And we, when we talk about informed consent, you you can't have an informed consent conversation if you're not informed yourself to to have that conversation. But Ken, I saw you shaking your head. So what are your thoughts? My thoughts are that every laceration that comes in is unique and different. And so you have to approach each one individually. And it starts with not everything needs to be closed. 
you know, like with sutures starting off the bat. So there are other ways to close things and do they need to be closed? On the face, uh, I use glue a lot, especially in kids' foreheads. Um, it's just changed my practice, especially lacerations on the scalp with children. I do this with the adults too, but you can take the hair and do a little crisscross applesauce and put a little dabble do you in the middle and you've got interrupted sutures that are natural because it's their own hair and you get this beautiful um, uh, fix. Uh, you just have to prepare the uh, caregiver about what to expect and how to manage glue. And so I think, A, do you need to close it at all? B, if you're gonna close it, can it be done with Steri strips? Can it be done with glue? Does it need sutures? And if so, what type of sutures would be best in that case and for how long? And on the face, you're talking a few days, not two weeks. And the inflammatory stuff that they have, it's unfortunate that you had got a keloid, but the cosmetic outcome with regards to uh, non-absorbable versus absorbable, they can't tell the difference by and large at the end. Nobody knows, like if they do a blinded study, which they've done and evaluated the lacerations on the face, absorbable versus non-absorbable, and nobody knew in the outcome evaluation what they got they can't figure them out. They can't pick those people out. So it's unfortunate that you got a keloid, but we need to treat every patient as an individual and empower them and give them agency to make uh, informed decisions like my colleague, Dr. Prescott said. Well, that inflammatory Look, thing that, that Rick was talking about is important to tell people about. I think yeah, you one just of the tell things, them in advance, this is yeah, gonna swell. It's gonna swell, it's gonna look red. But it's, it's gonna but look it fine in the end. Goes away. But, uh, can, I, I'd sure like to, it does. To, I'd like to pull this to the left completely and, and ask about the left? practice to patterns. the left, to the right, right. to the left. Um, back everything in a box to the um, left. <laughs> what I'd love to hear about people's um, approach to wound care and what you're recommending, whether that include topical antibiotics, whether that include uh, commercial emollients, um, or whether that you know I, I think that that is something that I hear about a lot. I see profound variability, triple antibiotic, bacitracin, vaseline, any sort of you know, concoction or, or, or which is potpourri that goes on these things. Uh, your bias and, is showing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but Rick, when, when, you, when you have multiple, multiple, multiple different ways to treat the same thing, it's usually an indication that nothing really makes a difference. I like it. I like that. It's a good point. Hey, Rick, before we thing... go on, we had uh, somebody in the uh, YouTube chat was asking, you know, if we were going to do this as far as an absorbable suture, what kind of absorbable suture is your preference? I'm thinking some sort of a monofilament would be the best if it's going to be exposed to the skin. Are you doing like a monocryl or something else? Yeah, you know, I, I love that question because if you had asked me several years ago, I would say micro repeat or monocryl um, or, um, you know, fast gut. And, and I, my thinking on this has evolved and I, I would certainly love to hear what other people are thinking. I, I, I think of terms in degradation. So I think fast right. gut is going to go away five days or so. I think of plain gut is going to go away 10 days or so. Chromic gut, maybe two weeks. And then I have comparators there. Vicryl repeat is a little bit like fast gut. Vicryl is a little bit like plain gut. Um, and, and I go from there and monocryl has this benefit of being monofilament, but do we really need Need that is a good consideration. But then I opened my own clinic and learned that these are ungodly expensive. expensive. <laughs> yeah. So then I really changed my tune a little bit and began to recognize the value of the cheaper of the um, uh, sutures, especially when they lead to the same outcome. So as much as I love, um, you know, monocryl is a beautiful suture and um, biosin and, and vicorepid, um, you know, get the cat skin it and put some cat cut it. You know what I mean? You know, whatever is available, keeping in mind um, the degradation time of the suture. And, and you want to try and time that as best you can. It's not going to be perfect um, to what you would want the timeline of suture tension to be. So if you don't own the clinic, it's monocryl. But if you do own the <laughs> clinic, then. <laughs> <laughs> or if you work in a county hospital, county uh, hospitals right. get whatever's less expensive. Yeah. That's so the right. other thing is for, um, for those clinicians that are putting in absorbable sutures, they tie differently. You've got to make those knots nice because uh, it's not as forgiving as a, a monofilament non-absorbable sutures. They don't lock up as nice. They slip and they okay. break. And so that tension that you're used to giving on a, you know, a 4-0 proline or something like that, you know, you put in a 5-0 uh, absorbable or a 6-0 for really nice cosmesis and stuff, you might need to 
put them a little closer together because you might lose one or when you're tying them snap and you go, oh, or oh, that is not the thing you want to say when you're working on someone's beautiful son and you're sewing up their face and, and you go, oops. As you I think you would say the... uh, sorry, wouldn't you in Canada, oh, Ken? Sorry. You're, you're going to bring Actually, this up, are you? you? I didn't say anything about cost and, and all of our, that stuff. I didn't bring up my socialized healthcare system. So you keep my O's and O's and abouts out of this, Mr. Yeah, I was right, born you... in Ottawa. I am, I am a, a believer in the true north, strong and free. I got my Tim Hortons Tim bits right here, eh? All right. All right so kitty cat, okay. <laughs> kitty, kitty cat on our chat wants to say that non-absorbable uh, gives you a chance to reevaluate the wound before they're gone for good. Um, I think that's kind of a nice point. If you're concerned about a wound or maybe something a little more complicated uh, on the face. Uh, I mean, I see the face that you're making, Rick, and I don't like it, but um, I think. I, that- I used to think the same thing is the thing I, that it compelled them to come back to me. It makes them come back. But, but I think that that's a little bit of a false star. Um, you know, we used to talk about in residency, put absorbables in to, or, or non-absorbables in to compel the patient to come back so you can reevaluate the wound. And, and when you dug into that even slightly further, it was, this is a patient who's at risk for poor follow-up, or this is a patient who has various risk factors for various morbidity. And that drove the very reason why you should put absorbables in so that they don't return two months later with sutures that were placed. We've all seen that. How many times? And if your concern is, I want the patient to come back, tell the patient, I would like you to come back. <laughs> you know, that, that conversation okay. about whether I'm going to take the sutures out or not is a completely different consideration than return for wound evaluation. I think in, the, in 2020, that'd be seen as kind of paternalistic. You know, they said like, oh, we're going to make them come back. You know, I had a patient in Afghanistan come back to our aid station about two months after we saw them to get his sternal IO removed. Okay. So if, if that doesn't oh compel you to come back, then, you know, sutures won't. <sighs> okay. I think I'm going to go to the next question now. Uh, so the next question, and it's a, it's the totally opposite end of the body. What should I do in the ER for a workup of foot drop? Hmm. This is an interesting mm. one. Hmm. 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 Well, let's start off by talking about why people get foot drop, right? So I think that should be the first thing on your mind when you see a patient with any complaint in the ER. What, you know, what are the reasons that might cause this particular ailment that this person is complaining of? So sure, you could have trauma that has that has caused this, some damage to the uh, perineal nerve. Um, certainly. Uh, a compartment syndrome, which would be obvious on your exam, hopefully, uh, if you're able to touch it and feel for any kind of tight, taut skin. And then, of course, the the big scary one that people are always worried about is an L5 compression in the back. So, you know, do you MRI these people or do you not? And and if you're in a care area where you can't get an MRI, would you transfer this patient uh, to get that MRI? So these are all considerations. I wonder how you all would handle the situation. If you don't know what's causing their foot drop, I wouldn't run right to an MRI. Um, I, I, part of this is history, right? So if somebody, so the, I learned about foot drop in medical school about a thousand years ago, with the whole referral back to carrying your books with a little book, little latch around your book that hit your, the outside of your leg, and it kept hitting the outside of your leg, and it hit your perineal nerve. I, it really depends on how they got it. You know, if somebody yeah. has a repetitive sort of trauma to an area that hits the perineal and they get a foot drop, I'm done. I don't have to do any kind of MRI. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so I think part of it is to back up a little bit and at least get some history before you go running to an MRI. Everything it's it's hugely based on the history. So what you should do for a workup, if I can summarize my colleague is a good history followed by a directed physical exam and then appropriate investigations based on that to confirm either ruling in or ruling out, right? So you've actually got to talk to the patient, look at the leg, look at the rest of the person, and then decide what to do. And look at the leg and look at the back. So part of yeah. the part of the concern is we we do worry about is there something happening up in the cord sure. or worse is there, you know, this is multiple myeloma that's caused a compression of the of the nerve root, you know, all those scary things, but you'll you'll do exactly that. And freak I I tell you a lot of the time you're not going to do any workup. My suspicion is this kind this kind of a specific question usually comes from something that didn't go terribly well yeah. 
in Anonymous's life who asked this question. And I yeah, or they or they had a cast on their leg and they took the cast off. Right. And when they took the cast off and it, and the cast was too high, right, for a below knee cast, and it put some pressure on the common perineal nerve. And now they have some foot drops from some neuropraxis, you know, so sometimes it's obvious, right? It's like, well, I think it's that big white thing you've been walking around for for six weeks. Yeah, or it could be they had a stroke six months ago and ever since then they've had a foot drop and they want to figure out what to do about it. Like, well, nothing today, you know, we're referring to neurology. I think that's a really good point that we need to make decisions. Are we doing something today or can it wait? And and that's the hard part about our job. I think um, the most difficult part is trying to decide, is this something that I need to to chase or is this something that maybe I can refer out and set up a plan for this patient in some way, shape or form? Okay, let's move on to the next question. Oh, I like this one. So I work in a county hospital too, Diane. Um, We see a lot of meth. And this question specifically is about methamphetamines. What is the best medication to treat patients who are high on meth? And if their troponin is elevated, do I need to be concerned about an MI? And then why do these patients go into heart failure? So like a lot about (laughs) meth right now. (laughs) Those are like three really disparate questions. I'll just mute and let Diane take that for the next hour. (laughs) You're right back. Yeah, we'll see you later. (laughs) Oh boy. You got 15 minutes, Diane. Yeah. All right. So meth, honestly, I'll tell you meth, a lot of, I'm going to back up a little to this. The implication here is what do you do with the whack, the the agitated delirious patient or the person who's really behaviorally a problem. And I want to just take that separately, separate from even meth. I think part of of de-escalating an escalated situation is an art form that we have lost. We have gone right to drugs. And if someone's agitated to the point of hurting themselves or others, fine. But I'm amazed how often you just talking quietly, using your voice, getting them le- you know, to a quieter part of the emergency room, you can get people to be calmer. So I think one thing I'd like to do is just de-emphasize running right to drugs for everything. That doesn't always help by any stretch of the imagination. Um, as far as, well, Martha, what do you use when you have somebody who's whacked out on meth? So, you know, a lot of people want to go right to the Ativan, and I think Ativan's a great drug for a lot of things. However, I go to Valium because it's longer acting, it's a little stronger, and it's just, it's worked better for me in my experience. And I, I can't tell you a day that's gone by at my new hospital where I don't see someone with a meth issue. We, you know, we send them to observation to, to wash out, you know, um, I see them and kind of want to help, help them feel better. But that would be my go-to. The problem I incur certainly is when they have these cardiomyopathies, when they have elevated troponins, and it's like, how far do I go for this? Because they didn't come here for that, but that's what they have. So my question on that is, why was it ordered in the first place? <laughs> like, what? Honestly, if somebody's I, I, seriously, this is where we get ourselves into testing quagmires. Like, why order it in the first place in somebody who's there because they're on meth? You know, if it's if it's a 50 year old with chest pain and on meth, okay, that's a different ball game. And even then, it becomes a bit of a quandary. But this this somebody's here, they're acting crazy. Just click the everything box to order. You end up in this kind of conundrum. Like, what do you do with that? And I don't think you even need to know it in most of the cases. So I think that's an interesting uh, question, and I'm sure you all have dealt with a provider in triage versus a provider not in triage, and my facility has chosen to not have a provider in triage for various reasons. I've come from a place where providers in triage has, have made a, a great deal of effort uh, helping these patients, but that was a check-all-boxes kind of patient. So, But you rarely know when they present that they're on meth alone. Right. And that's that can be a problem. It's like, oh, yeah, they're they're, you know, acting out or they're being very aggressive or they're high as a kite, whatever term you want to use. And it's not like they come in with a little dosette, you know, a little blister pack. And here's what they took. They took this many milligrams of this, you know, like it's usually like, "Mm, I don't know. Um, And so I think the nuanced conversation about which benzodiazepine, I think the answer is benzodiazepine, you know, and sometimes that might be I am medaz. The only time I think that, you know, the I, the MEDAS gets superiority in any studies is looking at status epilepticus. If you don't have an IV, boom, you know, I am. Other than that, I think we're into sort of like the esoteric nuances. And for a frontline clinician, I'm like, you got a benzo? Okay. You got some more benzo? You know, and you just get the benzo on board. Okay. 
I, I agree. I, there, I'm pretty sure actually there was a trial a few months ago that compared all the benzos, and the it conclusion did. was they're all the same. All the same. <laughs> no matter what, you, as, as yeah. Rick, as, as Ricky B says, yeah, I'm the guy that you know has a problem and reads all these literature. So, well, I, you know, I, I will say that there are operational considerations there. Yes. For example, mm-hmm. um, if you're going to combine, for example, a haloperidol and a benzodiazepine, the solubility of midazolam is questionable um, mm-hmm. alongside haloperidol, whereas the solubility of lorazepam is not questionable, and that has given rise to the you know 52 five of. But but are you guys being that. able to hold these people down and get that ECG for your quality control before you give the haloperidol? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> It's just like oh, we have a dispensation benzo, in that case. Low dark, um, right? <laughs> I, I think that you know one of the important things of emergency medicine is keeping an eye toward the future. And um, absolutely, we've had fantastic success with the use of benzodiazepines in the treatment of really what's agitated delirium and excited delirium, um, drug induced. And we we talk a lot about the use of ketamine for the treatment of agitated delirium. And I, I think that it has its role um, in the treatment of. Um, stimulant-induced uh, agitated delirium, but there's some exciting stuff on the horizon. Um, specifically, there's um, cocaine esterase formulations, which are can really be thought of as um, almost the naloxone for the treatment of cocaine intoxication and methamphetamine intoxication. Um, and a lot of those drugs are in like phase three trials right now, and I expect that we'll see them on the market within the next few years. Um, there's some logistical downsides, like right now they're all IV, not IM, so good luck tying somebody down and getting in an IV. But looking toward the future, which I think is emblematic of emergency medicine, we can see that really they, it's not ideal to just sedate people into oblivion if we had a different option um, to, you know, provide the antidote for what's causing the medical syndrome of delirium. Mm -hmm. Well, the other half of this question, you know, talks about, uh, you know, why patients get heart failure um, and why they get so sick. And, you know, actually, Diane, you do usually do a really good talk on cardiac stuff at our courses, um, talking about heart failure, you talk about arrhythmias, you talk about electrolyte imbalances, and these patients on drugs get a lot of those things. And Mm -hmm. if they are on, yeah, if they're on meth, they, you know, they might get a cardiomyopathy and that is because meth is a toxin to the heart. It is a legit, like make you sick kind of drug. It, I mean, these patients love it. The difference between a drug and a toxin is dose and duration. Oh, well, right? the drug makes the, what is it? The drug makes the poison. What is there? Or our, wait, the dose makes the poison. Yes, exactly. So it depends on how much you take and for how long, but um, please don't do math. That, that would be my. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it you does. Know, like, you know, I just don't think there's a safe dose to take. <laughs> no, there's no safe dose. Can I just do a little, little, little bit? Um, but yeah, so you get, the, you get these coronary artery vasospasms. And your heart essentially fails just like it would in any other, uh, you know, if you're looking at this from a pathophysiology standpoint, Diane, right? You know, your, your heart is a sick heart. And then uh, you, you have a cardiomyopathy. Your EF is low. You have, you know, these small vascular infarcts that are causing you to have failure. And it's just a downward spiral. And these patients, um, they don't do well at all because they keep using meth. So I think to answer this question completely, uh, I think you should do the best you can to get these patients to stop using drugs, but I haven't figured out a foolproof way to do that. I want to jump in real quick about patients like this, and that's kind of rude to say patients like this, like they're all the same or something, but you know, I think there is this fear among peers to, to overwork up patients who come in with substance use disorders for fear of, hey, I'm going to be looked at as, oh, I'm just kind of doing too much of a workup for this patient who we all know is just on drugs and is acting crazy or is looking for, you know, secondary gain here, stuff like that, you know, but it's these same patients who are at higher risk for really bad things, you know, so someone who does meth is at higher risk for heart failure, for aortic dissection. And so when I heard my meth abusing patient who was there in the ER, that the fourth time that day in the ER, it was my turn to see her. And she said, you know, I have pain in my chest and in my back. You know, I really took a second to be like, she was here for abdominal pain. She was actually uh, pregnant, by the way, at the time. And uh, I was like, well, great. Now she wants me to do a workup for, 
you know, other stuff and keep her here. But it's so easy to order a chest X-ray, an EKG, and a, a PUC troponin for a patient who has high risk of stuff like that. And she ended up having both at the very same time a, a stone in the neck of her gallbladder as well as a, a type A aortic dissection. And uh, so these patients are at higher risk for bad stuff. It's nothing to order these very low risk tests in patients who are at high risk for badness. And I think you do. I'm going to push back a little bit saying. though. Okay. Not, yeah. Good. So, because I, I agree that they're higher risk, that doesn't mean that everything gets ordered. Again, you're a clinician. So she told you she was having chest pain and back pain. It wasn't that she was just agitated, delirious that day, or just high on meth that day. She told you more than that. So part of it is there are medical errors you can make by commission as badly as you can make by omission. And if you order something that may not be indicated and end up going down a path that's unnecessary, you can cause harm as well. It's not it's benign, it's not it's benign to do. So I think I think it just falls back on what we talked about even when it comes to suturing, where you know, just be a clinician or a foot drop, or just be a clinician. You know, get your information. Um, make sure you th you think about how you're thinking about things so that you sort of you know, observe your thought processes and then rather than just checkbox or, or ignore either one, you know, both of them can be problematic. I don't think it's a pushback at all. The emergency oh, department ahead. three times. Uh, it, and if you're going to be seeing them the same time over and over, you're going to be, you're going to be seeing the same patients three times. You should probably should get somebody else to see that patient who has a clean view of this and is not um, bi biased uh, because you're, you're, you're likely to be missing something. And you know, pregnant women have a actually have an increased propensity for having aortic, you know, dissections and, and the like. So, uh, and cocaine, and you know, if you put enough uh, some uh, history together, somebody's ears might perk up on this. But I think that it look will look very very bad if somebody came back to the ER three or four times within a day and they had some kind of catastrophic outcome. You have to be extraordinarily careful on those cases. Diane, I didn't think about it as a pushback either. Uh, she did not admit the chest pain until later in the first workup. It had not been ordered initially, uh, all those things. And then about an hour or two in, she's like, now I'm having chest pain and back pain. It's like. Right. Which oh, says man. she might not even had it visit one. Right. So if she, it, she may not even have had it then, I mean, it evolved over time again. And, and Rick's point is well taken. Any bounce back, you should pay extra attention to people who are difficult. Yeah. You pay extra attention to, and and you do the you do. I, I learned this from Dr. Greg Henry, Henry. You say thank you for coming back and having the confidence in our department to give us another shot and let's take another look. Thank you. Like you don't go roll your eyes. What the hell are they doing here? I already saw them once. Can't they understand? We already did the workup. You know what do they want? As opposed to oh. Uh, you know, we said, you know, if you're worried or if you have new symptoms, X, Y, and Z, please come back. Thank you for following instructions. Let's dig into this. Let's, let's ask a few more questions and, and thank you, right? That attitude can go a long way for, you know, what Rick was talking about, Dr. Bucata about bias, right? Because if you get your blinders on and you're worn down from, uh oh, Martha, I'm going to say it. COVID, you know, you might get a little bitter, you might get a little jaded, you might get a little, uh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm exhausted, I don't like wearing these N95s, I'm tired, I'm grumpy, and whatever, and you get dismissive. And, and it really is an opportunity when somebody comes back to say, thank you for coming back. Thank you for trusting our organization. Let's take another look. All right, that's actually a good segue to our next question about people that come back. <laughs> So this next one is specifically about people that are coming back for headaches, but it's not, it's not just your regular headache. Uh, this is someone that has a known diagnosed brain tumor. So the question is, what do I do for a patient who has a brain tumor and comes in for a headache? What are the best medications for headaches in patients with brain tumors? And if they are not on seizure medications, should I start them? When do I do imaging? Do I do one every time they have a headache? This is complex. So I see these patients. You all see these patients. The answer is it all depends. Rick? <laughs> We're I mean, I was going to say the answer is yes. A headacheologist with us tonight. Yes, yes. Rick, Rick, go for it. Yeah. Well, I do like headaches, and I agree completely. Yeah, you do? With, I, I love, love myself oh, a headache. Yeah, um, so. um, I, you know, I agree completely with Ken that there's a lot that goes into that. Certainly the patient who's at the end of life with known severe illness, who comes in with a headache and known brain metastases is not going to get imaging. And the, this list goes on. Um, it's important to remember that headaches 
happen for a number of reasons. The patient who comes in with a known space occupying lesion, who comes in with worsening headache, should absolutely get imaging, should absolutely get neurosurgical consultation. There's really not a lot of question about that. The question of whether or not to initiate anti epileptics in that population, the answer is, as always, it depends. The answer is, as always, probably. The answer is, as always, consult neurosurgery and neurology to help arrive at that decision. Um, and there are varying data that really purport to support one anti-epileptic over another, but it's probably more that none of the other anti-epileptics were super well studied, and the risk-benefit analysis tilts strongly toward benefit in that type of population. We know, of course, that those patients will have headache driven by their increased intracranial pressure, and we can talk about Monroe-Kelly doctrines, or we can talk about the other Monroe-Kelly doctrines, and, um, and we can have all sorts of fun there, but there's not too much that you can do. And we have to think a little bit about how the treatment of the brain uh, of a headache in a patient with a space-occupying lesion is fundamentally different from a patient with a benign primary headache. And the, the, what it comes down to is the only sort of treatment that has a difference there is steroid. And the thing is that that doesn't change what you're going to do because you're going to give steroid whether you have a, a non-space-occupying a, a lesion, except for certain ones, um, or a non-occupying lesion, but it does different things. So we use dexamethasone, for example, um, in patients with space-occupying lesions to decrease cerebral edema, but we use dexamethasone in patients with benign primary headaches because it decreases bounce backs and recurrence of the headache. So they do different things, but we're given the same drug and we're given it the same way and we're given the same dose. Um, but I, I think that if I had to say something about the treatment of a patient with a, a headache from a space occupying lesion, it's to understand that, you know, they don't have what we typically see in the emergency department, which would likely be migraineous or tension headache. They have a space occupying lesion. And I will, till the day I die, hold signs that say don't use opioids for the treatment of headache until we encounter the headache secondary to space occupying lesion. So uh, that's probably the one thing I'd want to highlight more than anything that we can talk about all sorts of awesome headache therapies. I love me treating some headaches. Um, but the biggest difference here, the biggest operational difference is that for as long as every single person on this panel, and I believe every person listening to us right now would say that opioids are not indicated in the treatment of primary benign headaches, they absolutely are indicated if felt appropriate by the clinician in the treatment of headaches secondary to space occupying lesion. And yet, you know, uh, studies from community hospitals in the U.S., show that two thirds of uh, primary headaches get an opioid. Isn't that, that just, a travesty? Isn't that an absolute right? travesty? You know? It is and the data shocking. shows it's, it's you know? the worst. It's, it's, it's like the least effective yes. uh, treatment yeah, strategy. That's probably old data. It, it's, it's, it's no, changed. there's new, I just wrote a chapter on this, Rick. That is not old. It is still in practice. Well, that chapter hasn't come out yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's out, damn it. But I'm telling you, there are, um, there are places in the United States that are not just giving opioids for the treatment of headache right now. They're giving Demerol for the treatment of headache, Meperidine for the treatment of headache. They're giving Demerol? Hydromorphone for the treatment. Yeah, Demerol. I've we, seen we do, we do, I, have, I haven't seen Demerol in any – I've been doing this for 23 years. I haven't seen any Demerol for at least 15. I, no, no, I, we you don't know, have it. The day, there, there, is, there is good data. Pescator et al. Annals of Headache Medicine. <laughs> um, that, okay. that shows that that the use of opioids, just as you said, in current everyday um, emergency medicine practice, is is unbelievable. Despite overwhelming data that it's not only um, so Rick, not effective. I'm going to slow harmful. you down. Slow down. Slow down. What I want you to do instead, then, for the listeners on this call, is give them the alternative. All right. Fair. Very fair. Very fair. Well, so I'm gonna. I, well, let me interrupt for just one second because for because we both uh, do our due diligence for EM News. We write for EM News. We we go through the data. We go through the literature. We Jim Roberts just recently published an article on migraines. If we're simply talking about migraines, there's only three drugs, three drugs that are indicated for the treatment of migraine. That's the anti-dopaminergic, right? Like Compazine. Where are you going? NSAIDs. <laughs> and what's the third one? I'm going to say there's a lot more than that. So Okay, well, um, but the only ones that have been proven in the literature to be effective for status migraine, a migraine, okay? We're not talking about brain tumors now. We're talking about migraines. So I, I completely agree with you that the anti-dopaminergic drug class is fantastic here. And we can talk about prochlorperazine. You, could, you can talk about metoclopramide yes. and, and the yes. the 
the answer to that is probably whichever one you have more of or are more comfortable with. <laughs> There's data that kind of lands on either side and it, it's, you know, they're both good. Um, okay. Um, I, I agree with you completely that NSAIDs have a fantastic place in the treatment of migraine. And Ken, I, I think there, I know there's going to be a later question about this and we're going to talk about Ketorolac. And, and I, I think that we should talk about Ketorolac in the treatment of of migraineous headache, because I think that it can throw some people for a loop. I'd love to tackle that. But there are other things here oh. which are, have proven. <laughs> I see a head shaking. I see a head shaking. Uh oh. Yeah. Dr. So, over there. So the reason why I don't want you to talk too much about Toradol right now, because we, we do have some questions. Um, we, I want to get to some COVID questions sort of in the, in the interim here, but we do have some questions about I am Toradol uh, versus PO. NSAIDs like ibuprofen of some sort generic uh, and which one is better or more effective, right? So let's, can we just put that on hold for just a minute? I, I just want you to summarize your, your best treatment for a migraine. What you well, there's no best treatment, right? So everybody has a different, it's important to remember the pathophysiology of migraine, leverage your anti-dopaminergics. Don't be afraid of the tryptan class if you need to be. It has a role in a very narrow population of patients and it's effective. Remember oh, so that, that, was the, that was the third class, just so everybody understands it was... Yes. Just um, so everybody knows. Keep going. Use your anti-dopaminergics. -dop uh, have a uh, delve into the literature surrounding diphenhydramine or, or benztropine as necessary for the um, avoidance of extrapyramidal effects. So There's a lot of conversation there. Um, and then there's litany other interventions here. We can talk about the use of magnesium, which is minimal data, but mm -hmm. minimal harm and something to consider in the treatment of status migranosis. Don't forget that dihydroepiergotamine, DHE, is a reasonable mm -hmm. and effective drug for the treatment of migraine. Don't forget about valproic acid. And then consider the alternative headache therapies, which have really become more in vogue in emergency medicine in the past few years. And that includes things like nerve blocks, phenopalatine, with the treatment of a third occipital nerve block. These are fantastic interventions, which are low risk uh, low and high reward and should absolutely be considered. And this list goes on and on and on and is... Um, one of my favorite things to explore. Um, but there are a few ways in the emergency department where we can change somebody's life um, and helping them uh, begin a new path uh, with migraines, which are unbelievably debilitating, destroy lives, destroy, um, you know, cost us in terms of GDP, millions upon millions of dollars a year. Um, we can have a lot of effect in the emergency department. Exploring that literature is very rewarding. Bravo. All right, moving on. Let's talk about hypertension. Let's totally change it up. And then we're going to talk about COVID. Ooh, High blood like pressure this. does not cause a headache. There you go. Okay, fine. We've covered that. <laughs> that I was the segue. Really, that was the segue between headaches and uh, high blood pressure. I really like this next question because I've worked in urgent cares. And, uh, you know, I, I know what to do when people have super high blood pressure and they're symptomatic. I want to treat them. And. Uh, you know, they could be very sick. However, this person is asking something very specific. I'm wondering about the workup for hypertension urgency or hypertensive emergency, as well as treatment in an urgent care setting. We don't have cardiac monitors. We don't have access to troponins. And uh, what are the best ways to, to deal with this? And I think there's an answer that I know you're all going to say, but transfer. <laughs> if you're really concerned? Well, here's the hard part about being in urgent care is that you see all the scary patients with the benefit or, or the lack of the benefit of having all the toys you have in the emergency department, you know? So you've really got to be on your game as far as history and physical and risk factors for the patient. So someone rolling in with a high blood pressure that they took at home, or maybe they even get you know, one second after the triage nurse throws them into a chair and slaps a BP cuff on them, you know, we have to kind of reevaluate them. Like, let's give them five minutes to just sit in a chair, you know, feet on the floor, back supported, and take a good blood pressure at that point, you know? And then hearing about their complaints. So what are you feeling that makes you think that this high blood pressure today is a problem? You know, when we're talking about someone who has chest pain, visual disturbances, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, they haven't urinated in, you know, 12 to 24 hours. Like, okay, well, maybe there is some sort of, uh, organ failure. That's that's the key for hypertensive emergency, right? Is that there's organ damage being done due to the high blood pressure. But if this is a patient who just says, 
hey, I happened to be at my grocery store and I sat in one of those chairs and I took my blood pressure and it was high. And that's why I'm coming in. I have no symptoms. Um, you know, those patients in an ER, at least in my ER, would get a very minimal workup. You know, you know, I think that the literature stands up pretty well that if you have hypertensive emergency, as in organ failure, there's going to be some sort of symptoms there other than the numbers are scary. And this is you, this is you too. No, I could try, so I completely agree. I think that the, I think we often do more harm than good when it comes to elevated blood pressures. Um, there's a sort of this feeling of making somebody's vitals normal before you feel comfortable. But the reality is walking and talking out there in the world right now, like right now, are probably millions of people walking around with high blood pressure that are, at least as of right now, doing just fine. Most hypertension, as far as end organ issues, is a chronic problem, not an acute problem. And our job is to recognize the acute issue today that we need to deal with today and whether it's related to that blood pressure or not. So, so the number itself doesn't really mean much. The number in the context is what makes the difference. So that patient that Mike Sharma saw with the chest pain and back pain, if she had a blood pressure that was high or a history of hypertension, I'm worried about dissection. And that's an end organ problem from an elevated blood pressure that's a worry both now and chronically, but now is the one that's going to kill them. Or somebody who, that I'll tell you that we see, I'll tell you what you're not going to see. You're not going to see somebody who comes in in a little bit of pulmonary edema or because they're having elevated blood pressure. If their blood pressure is up and they're in pulmonary edema, they went into pulmonary edema first. It's, it's not from the actual elevated blood pressure. It's usually the other way around. So part of this is figuring out what is truly the end organ emergency here. Um, this urgency idea is really not a thing. It's just not a thing. Um, it just gives you the, the sort of feeling better about yourself when you order things that may not be indicated like an EKG. You know, an EKG may show LVH. What do you do with that? I don't know what to do with that. It's, I'm not surprised it has that. That's fine. Why would you order a chest x-ray if the patient has no lung findings, no pulmonary complaints, no shortness of breath? Why would you order a chest x-ray? So, so these, these ideas that there's certain things you have to order just because there's a number that the patient has is wrong. Um, and, it, and, there's, and I think, is this the one that said guidelines? That actually, ASAP has some guidelines on this. And the JNC, they said that the so recommendations on hypertension management are superb that'll help guide you. But the thing is to de-escalate this idea of treating a number and go back to what we always were talking about, which is you're treating the patient, not the number itself. So that's a patient-oriented yeah. outcome, a poo, as opposed to a monitor-oriented outcome, a Moo. <laughs> and so we want to treat the patients, not the number. I love what you said there. And the more we focus in on, oh, what's your blood pressure? What's your blood pressure? We've all seen it where somebody takes their blood pressure. Oh, it was 145. That's a little high for me. I better take it in. Oh my God, it's 150. Oh, I better go to the drugstore and get a, a real machine. Oh my God, it's 165. I'm heading into the emergency department or the urgent care. Are you and short of breath? Yes. That shows, that shows up with the little book that they bought in the drugstore yes. with the timing of every oh, blood yes. pressure they take. You know, and I can see yeah. here at five o'clock, I was 142 over 100. Now I'm 145 over 95. I wrote that down. So, um, yeah, so treat the, um, treat the patient, not their pressure, treat, yeah. treat them, not the monitor. And, uh, I always, uh, there are very few indications where you, you really need to urgently lower them, right? You know, there's, there's the, the eclampsic patient, there is the dissection. I think that somebody mentioned there's certain things with regards to, uh, hemorrhagic strokes that you want to keep the blood pressure, not super low, but lower, you know, so there's very, there's very narrow indications for that. The rest of them, Diane, you said this already, it's a chronic condition. And so I tell them, look, it, it probably took you months to years to get up this high. I think we've got some time to lower it. Let's get you some primary care and that kind of stuff, but let's have a soft landing. Cause if we shift your blood pressure and get it to normal now, which I can do, it'll be too much of a shock to your system and I can cause harm. Well, I think the big take home here for this question is, Diane, you specifically pointed out uh, some resources in which, which our listeners can go the to. The ASAP one is good. Right. So the ASAP's good. Um, the JNCC, the, um, excuse me, the JNC7 and the uh, American Heart Association, they all have recommendations. So you can look at those and find them to be helpful. 
And if you want to feel comfortable not ordering tests, go to the ASAP guideline. It will tell you it's okay. So if you want, I feel someone very to comfortable not ordering permission. tests. Yeah, but I think some people listening might not be. So no, I know. If you yeah. want to feel comfortable, there it's no, right it, there in black and white. Yep, gives you a good uh, a good resource. Is excellent, Martha. You know. Yeah. In terms of things that you could do, uh, in terms of uh, changing the world, the identification of elevated blood pressure when people come in, no matter what the reason is, um, and having that number checked again and saying, you know, your blood pressure is a little bit uh, high, uh, we'd like to refer you to somebody. That's probably more important than all the tetanus shots you've given and all the, you know, wound care yeah. that you've given that it was going to get all, and the babies, that sick babies, they were all going to get well on their own. So, uh, and there have been some studies that looked looked at, at blood pressure, and it and it's often ignored when numbers are should not be ignored. Um, and it's it's just kind of like we measure that number, that number comes back abnormal. We have to do something about it. It's basically, and, and in this case, we're going to tell somebody about it. Your here's our, I'm going to write it down. This is what your blood pressure is today. We took it a couple of times. Take this to Dr. Jones. Is going to see you next week. But I don't think this I, clinic. I, I hope uh, people don't get the message that we should ignore it. It's just a matter of what Martha said earlier. Is this a, a today problem, an emergency or an urgency today, or is this something that can be dealt with as an outpatient setting? Well, I'm talking about the other end where they they come in for some other totally reason. unrelated matter, yeah. and yeah, we take their temperature identified. and their pulse and their blood pressure, no matter what the heck is wrong with you. And, th and then we find, well, this is this is outside the range of normal. And we have some responsibility, I think, to either yep. verify it or refer it or do well, something about that's it. That's the integrity part of medicine, right? And then we started off this whole conversation talking about this very thing, you know, having integrity with your patient and having integrity with your job. You know, you're not going to ignore the patient on meth, right, Diane, that like you want to help. You know, you certainly you're going to do everything that you can to get them like the resources they need. You're not going to see someone with a high blood pressure and just like ignore it. You might. You, well, you think, mention, I, you know, and refer if it's, if it's something that, you know, needs to be referred. doesn't mean you have to do anything about it in your ER or urgent care, but you got to tell your patient, you have to but, include that they don't have that medical knowledge that you have. That's why they're there. Right. But I'm but looking you at can the other end. I'm, I'm looking at the people who, who, um, are not there for anything related to the blood pressure. And this is an incidental finding. So you tell them. And, and the studies that I've seen basically say there's a huge number of people where they that that they're not told. Let me tell you something about an incidental finding that I'm going to get really like uppity about right now because it goes all the way back to my keloid. OK, oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, so, go. No. So this is just a total <laughs> side note. And this changed my practice. And I think it's important. You know, uh, before we go to talk about COVID, which is next, I just want to transition by saying everything you do matters. When I was in the ER 10 years ago, I had a terrible migraine. Okay. Pescator, you know what they gave me? Dilaudid. What yeah. happened? What That's happened? That's why you got your keloid. <laughs> when I got that Dilaudid, I was so sick. I hated every second of it. It was the worst experience. My headache was worse. It was awful. So they sent me to get a CTA of my head and neck. And you know what they found? Big old tumor in my neck. Keloid. Right? Yep. Incidental anyway. finding. Okay. Incidental finding right here. So a couple years later, you know, I get my continual ultrasounds of the neck and it got bigger. But that doctor sat down, printed out the copy of my CT report and said, hey, Martha, you know, I know you're here for a headache, but we found this thing. I'm going to, I want you to follow up with that. I know that's not why you're here. But I'm worried about it. And this is all about the keloid. You, you've never gotten over that keloid, damn it. I'm never let over it, it. Let it scar. Just let it. Oh, wait a minute. But that doctor and his, <laughs> and his, and his name was John Sanfuentes, which was a wonderful physician that I've worked with for many years in the past. And he said, you really got to get that checked out. I did. Turned out to be a cell tumor. I had to get a lot of treatments. I had surgery. I'm now with the keloid and that's fine. But, you know, I could have been dead. This wouldn't even be happening if some doctor didn't say, here's your report with your incidental finding. So on hypertension. An, on, an, uh, on an unnecessary test that you shouldn't have had in the first place. No, I, you know, look, we can argue about that. That's fine. But what I'm just trying to say is that when patients have hypertension, if they have a drug addiction, if they have, uh, 
who knows anything else. There's no reason why you can't step in and say, Hey, you know, follow up with this. Here's some, here's the clinic, whatever, go to your doctor, have some integrity. That's our job. That is our job, whether you like it or not. And I think our listeners, um, hopefully are doing that. That's all. So this, uh, session is scheduled to go to um, 9.30 Eastern. Um, and so we have about a half an hour left. So, so we're going to go wanna, to COVID. Well, we don't need to do a half hour of COVID because, uh, you know. Please God, no. Uh, please, <laughs> just uh, focus uh, in on hydroxychloroquine thanks. or something. Oh, Jesus. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, but Diane, Diane, there's some great questions about intubation here and BiPAP and things like that that I feel like would be useful. I mean, I can tell you a couple well, of things. To, but let's do the control act too because that okay. got brought up. And okay. got some LP stuff in here. And there's some good stuff something in here. Simple. Something simple. Something easy, you know. Something simple. A softball. Okay, a softball. Let's talk about um, pain control. P.O. Motrin as effective as I am Ketorolac. Boom. Oh, really? Yeah, Ken. Is it? Tell oh. Me. Is yeah, it? Sorry. The, the question is, is it as effective? Yeah. The, qu was, the question yeah. is, is P.O. Motrin as effective as I am Ketorolac? The answer control. is it all depends. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean by effective? And and so again, you know, like the pain control. Really, yeah. So yeah, but effective pain control, i.e., does the patient feel better? And is it because of the different uh, uh, NSAID that was used? There's nothing super fancy about Ketorolac other than it's the only one that can be injected, right? And so it's an NSAID. And so we often use Ketorolac as, oh, we're taking the patient's pain more seriously. We gave them an IM injection. And so you really have to consider that there's a placebo effect to that. And the more invasive and more painful, anybody here had a Toradol shot at Ketorolac? Oh, it burns. Like it's got, so, oh, that's strong stuff, right? And so there, there's a real, um, A, the clinician is taking this seriously. My pain is you know, they're, they're recognizing that I'm in a lot of pain. They're not just offering me some PO ibuprofen that I can get over the counter and they're injecting it. And so that must mean they're taking my pain seriously. And if I come back 15 minutes later and say, Ooh, did you get the burn? How's that pain medicine I gave you by needle working? There's going to be a, I want to please the clinician and say, yeah, it's a lot better doctor. Or like Rick did and just give me a big clap. He's trying to kill a fly. Obviously. <laughs> I thought he was, I thought you were clapping for me, Rick. And I was <laughs> like, one one clap, one clap. Um, but but there there, but there are, are reasons to use out there that there, show. There, well, I was just gonna say there's different nuances. As in, you know, if they're vomiting, obviously you can't give it orally, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should give it IM. No, no. What about yeah, IV then? Or or suppository. You know, indomethacin. I've been I, I've been practicing long enough to you know we used uh, indomethacin suppositories for all that gout and renal colic and stuff like that. You had to be in a lot, lot of pain to have that you know modality. But guys, what's the answer? The audience so wants the answer, to know. What's I, the I agree answer? with what's, what's Ken the question. Here. I, I, yeah, what, I I agree with Ken that there is a lot of nuance to NSAIDs, and we yes. gloss over them so easily. Oh, it's Motrin, it's ibuprofen, it's the it's all the same, and. It's, you know, the, the answer is that so for, most people, the, for the most people, it's probably pretty similar, right? But to uh, ignore that there can be fundamental differences, just if a patient's vomiting, but go even deeper than that, that there can be underlying metabolic differences in patients. These are different drugs. They're not the same. We forgot about it. We all learned about it in school, and then we promptly put it out of our minds. We have to remember that NSAIDs like uh, ibuprofen and naproxen are propionic acids. NSAIDs like uh, ketorolac and diclofenac are heteroreal monoacetic acids. My favorite is meloxicam, which is an oxicam. So I remember that really easily. But I mean, these are different drugs with different metabolic pathways, different PKAs, different distributions into different types of tissue. And there are studies that show that one drug is better than another in ankle sprains. There are some drugs that show that one drug isn't better than another in osteoarthritis. And what the answer is, just like sort of uh, Ken said, that you know, if there's a million different ways to treat something, it probably means that one isn't any better than the other. But it also probably means that some might work better for others in certain scenarios. Like we've learned a lot about how there are unique patient considerations that um, have to be considered here. Um, and so what, where do I land on all of this? What does this mean to me? I, I have one, my sort of flag that I wave, which is, you know, we know that in the overwhelming majority of most people with most types of pain, um, that, uh, 
that 10 milligrams of IV Ketorolac is uh, just as good as 15, as 20, as 30, is just as good as 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, right? Except when the patient uh, has a headache um, and the only uh, dose of Ketorolac and the only route of Ketorolac that is well validated in that population is 60 milligrams IV. And except when we're talking about the treatment of gout, for example, where uh, naproxen in the recent contact trial outshined different treatment methods, not other NSAIDs, uh, but naproxen showed benefit, not ibuprofen, right? So the best data set we currently have is in naproxen. And so if a patient comes into your emergency department, you know, I took ibuprofen and it didn't really help me it's a little disingenuous to switch them to naproxen. They're both propionic acids, and you can make an argument that maybe there's a difference, but maybe just take it one step further and give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe Toradol does work a little bit better for them. And maybe it's not just because they get a burning in the in the bicep. Maybe it's not just because it's an injection, but maybe it's because it has a slightly different metabolic route uh, because it's a heteroreal monoacetic acid than ibuprofen or naproxen. It would be make- nice if it would be nice if people actually thought like you're suggesting, but I don't think that's the case. I think that in a lot of emergency departments, it's like uh, um, the knee-jerk drug to go to for headache, back pain. No matter what kind of pain you have, everybody's going to get it. There's no nuances about it. It's it's like, it, it's, it's the... Um, I, th- I think one of the biggest nuances, though, that I think that I would want people to take away from this is that when it comes to NSAIDs as opposed to other analgesics is to recognize the overall ceiling effect that these drugs have. And so if you're using an NSAID, you have to realize that going higher and higher and higher at the dose, it is not a linear curve. Look, I'm going to drop from this corner all the way to this corner. It does. It has a ceiling effect and plateaus. And so once you get above 400 of Advil or ibuprofen, sorry, you don't get any additional benefit, except for maybe longer duration of action and more side effects. Same thing you mentioned, Sergei Motov's study of the dosing trial of Ketorolac. Oh, great, so, great, so, great guy, by the way. Uh, Everyone should check that so out. 10 milligrams. Uh, uh, you know, you're not getting more benefit necessarily in the vast majority of cases. So I see people that come in, you know, with renal colic and somebody's giving them 60 of Toradol, Ketorolac, or they're giving them 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. And there's a ceiling effect there, not the anti-inflammatory effect, but the ceiling effect for the analgesic effect. So I think that's a good take-home message. So let's use the minimum dose required to get the analgesic required and recognizing the other side of the equation is always harm. Hey, Pesky, can you make a, a cheat sheet card for us for all these different issues, please? And I'll get that like in the next week. Thanks. Well, homework. With nothing else to do. Nice. So, yeah. yeah. Hop on that. It's, a, it's a big chore, you know. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the other question about um, Ketorolac because there's a huge debate. And I'll tell you, I was scolded bad for giving IV Toradol prior Why? to any kind of surgery. Why? Why Why were people scolding people? Why? I was yeah, in li- that's I the was bigger in li- point. Why are people acting like adults? But why, why slap hands? And why not just say, <sighs> hey, I see you gave some Ketorolac. Can you tell me more about that? Pretty much I was told that uh, I must be new. Must be new. That because patient's going to bleed out now because I got one dose of Toradol before their that's surgery. Sharma, that's what they said. You know, so and, let's clear and, this up. But those kind of comments, th- that, but that's not about, it's about those kind of comments. That's a behavioral issue. And I'm a chief of staff. And so getting these, you know, comments where we've got different providers and, and crapping on each other and getting tribal and saying, I can't believe you did that, rolling your eyes. Sorry, I'm going to get worked up about that. But that's something I feel really passionately about, that we need to be nicer and kinder to each other mm-hmm. and not just jump to conclusions and go, I can't believe you just put a splint on that instead of a circumferential cast. What are you, new or something? <laughs> Well, so, actually, I hear that but, all the time. So I hear that. I hear that. But <laughs> well, that you're new? <laughs> yeah, circumferential cast. That debate has roiled my life. Ken. Oh, you know. Well, I mean, you know, because I think, you know, oh, I want to make I sure. I didn't want to go there. We address it. <laughs> Listen, you know, um, civility in medicine is the most important thing here. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I got called into chief of staff office when I was a junior, like a ju- like a new attending, because I put on a um, a splint instead of circumferential cast. That's why I brought that you one up. Noob. And you I was noob. raked over the coals. And I'm I'm like, okay, well, here are the three studies in a systematic review that says it's not necessary. But okay, whatever. 
And there's the very same studies that show that Ketora lactosing prior to surgery does not increase blood. Exactly. So why don't you just say, rather than jumping down each other's throats, just take a pause and have some civility about this, people, and be nice and kind and just ask a follow-up question. So I see that you gave that. That's interesting. Why why, did you pick that before that? And just have a discussion. This, let's say this patient's been having bad pain for the past two or three days, right? And that's why they're coming into the ER because what they did at home didn't work. Let's say they've been crushing ibuprofen for three days in a row before they came in and you find they have a hot whatever, gallbladder. And, you know, if you tell the surgeon that, the surgeon's not going to be like, oh my gosh, three days of ibuprofen, we can't go to surgery because of this bleeding <laughs> risk, you know? So it's like, I think he just saw the target opportunity there and he wanted to get in a soapbox for a little while. And it's not cool. You know, like I, I wish some of these colleagues that supposed to be colleagues, you know, would read the literature like I think EM clinicians do. Oh, gosh, I, I don't want to go there. But, you know, it's I, not I think- even reading the literature, Mike. It's just actually asking a question as, yeah. instead yeah. of assuming something or making an assertion that you're an idiot and you've done something wrong as a, you know, like. I can't keep up. I, I'm, I've got a problem, right? I do a lot of reading. I do have a problem, but you know, we're all on the spectrum. I'm just not saying which one I'm on, but, uh, but the thing is to, you can't possibly stay up on everything and there might be some new information. And so how did you respond to that, Martha? Because that's an important uh, thing. Like, did you go, Oh, I got something in my eye, you know, like, uh, you, you know, know, like, you know yeah, what I said, I said, um, there's no reason why you can't go to surgery with this patient because of that single dose. But if you'd like to show me a reason why, I'd be happy to read it. Yeah, like how do you manage that that conflict? I think that's they really wanted important. me to send the patient to observation overnight because surgery couldn't be done because of my single dose tour at all. And um, it's going to take sorry, a while for I those just... platelets to recover. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, well, it's it's, it seems like a benign topic, but. You know, I think Ken, I think it's an important topic and it's something that we don't get training in, but mm-hmm. neutralizing language, you know, help me understand, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm confused, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, you know, the history of emergency medicine is that we came from a very weak place. Uh, we were the uh, doctors who uh, didn't find any other jobs to do. Uh, you're not like, going to throw your life away to go into emergency medicine. And so we came from there. And it took a long time to get uh, board certified, and they had to have other doctors on our on our board, and and so I think that there is a certain um, prejudice that may may exist out there among certain clinicians uh, looking back on that old stuff about emergency physicians really just don't aren't aren't don't know that much, and you know, and I think that really one of the things to do is. Um, Show them literature. Show them when you when you when you do something and you, you get criticized for it. If you can say, "Well, here's the reason I did it," and I, here's three papers, and they're not going to have any papers that say why why their position was right. So after a while, they start to get the sense, "Geez, this person's doing stuff uh, using literature." Um, I, so I better be careful when I criticize this person again because I. I, he already kind of got me. But there twice is, a, there now. is. A, you're talking. You're talking cl- uh, physician to physician, and I, you know, I'm really sensitive to the idea of PAs and NPs yeah. and the power imbalance that can. Oh, take it's even place. worse. You know, and but <sighs> what I find, and I've worked with um, PAs and NPs. By the way, love it, love it. Um, you know, they're usually they're the ones that are up on the literature that because they're like, Oh, I better not take this on unless I'm really sure I've got something in my back pocket. Yeah. So I'm not going to question the physician unless I'm holding on to something in my back pocket. So I I actually find that the PAs and NPs are often quite current compared to maybe some of my other colleagues. Well, that's why I think our course that we do when we, I mean, look at us all getting together right now. We have uh, MDs, we have DOs, we have PAs and we have NMP and we have people from Canada. We got a Canadian. So like we, we got can people all get along. on the East coast, got people on the West coast. I mean, I, you know, I think that if we can all get along in a conference in Las Vegas and so we can get along anywhere else, no matter who we are anywhere. But all right, mom, listen, throw- can we start the, the COVID discussion? Oh, please. Oh, okay, you really wait. want to do the COVID-19? Or no, well, the, they, uh, There's so many other great questions here that I really wanted to like, 
Listen, have Diane we promised, tackle, but Doctor, we'll just do um, yes, no, then. Okay. Yes, no question. Oh, you want to do let's some do, yes, no? Do rapid fire. Yeah. yeah, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no for for three minutes or something. Okay, here quick. we go. Are you ready? Throw, just we, briefly we, for we, two we, seconds. We, I want to listen. One. Nobody's obligated to stay listening to this stuff. We could go on for hours if you're willing to do that. But you know, right now we have two hundred. We have. We have 229 listeners, so, oh, you know. Hi, everybody. Hey, That's guys. Cool. How hey. you doing? Hello. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Hey, Martha, I want to throw in a quick solution, you know, based answer here to when someone comes strong to you and says, hey, why did you do X, Y, Z? You know, they're coming from a place of they are smart and you are stupid. And so to some degree, instead of going back against that and going, no, actually, I'm smarter than you are, maybe you play into that and go, oh, wow. Like, so uh, for me, forgive me, I, I don't know the literature you're referring to that talks about why it's important to not give Tordal before surgery. Um, can you, can you share that with me, the, the literature you're referring to here and kind of let, give them the rope and let them kind of play with that rope a bit. And, but, but it's also the time and place to take it on too. For sure. Yes. You know, like that might not be the, I'm not going to, this is not a hill I'm going to die on right now. Yeah. Let's put that aside and, and, and less dramatic time or less confrontational time, bring it up in an more. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to interject one thing. I, I think after having practiced a long time, um, we don't need to apologize. I, I think yeah, starting, I was going to say, yeah. starting with an apology, and women are taught this because women start with apologies all the time, which completely undermines your credibility. So I think starting with just a, I think you know, Rick Pescator started with this, boy, you know, it was my understanding that this, yeah. this is why we would do it. Um, I'd love to learn more. You know, if you know something that's different, I want to practice the best medicine I can. So, so please teach me. I would love that because it was my understanding this, but not with an apology. I think the problem yeah. with an apology is it starts us in a hole where that where there it feeds into that I'm better than you are whole thing. Um, so putting it a little more on an even keel, I think, especially in emergency medicine, I'll tell you, especially for the women on this call, it's just a thing that women do all the time um, as a as a default that I think undermines your, your ability to just be respected. And just a little plug, if you guys uh, aren't connected with FemEM, um, Diane has done some stuff with uh, FemEM. It's very interesting. A lot of really wonderful women involved in that. I suggest uh, checking it out if you get a chance. Um, I, I, this... I, I, I spoke at FemEM yes, last you did. year. Oh, yes, wait, it was one of three that guy men. too. It was a that keynote, guy. a keynote, no less. I, keynote. You know, I always forget about that, but actually, yes, you are very, you know what, Ken, you're a good guy. We love you. They're just good. You're just good people. Okay. okay let's do yes, no's. Let's, let's okay. do rapid fire. I don't know if you can do a yes, no for this. Oh, sure you can. Well, sure no, can. just go to the ones you can. Scoo scooch down. Yeah, I'll scooch down because I'm not going to ask you when to start blood thinners no, after. No, 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 Just We should down. all have to raise our hand at the same time. Like one, this left <laughs> hand for yes and right hand for no. Like one There's up, reactions. Up, we can clap our hands as in don't do that. Okay, yeah. okay. Oh, okay, here we go. Wait, can you use PO contrast for abdominal CT scans? Can you? Yes, you can. You can. You, you can. can. <laughs> do I? You shouldn't. Should you? Should you? <laughs> for the most. Small bowel <laughs> most obstruction, things, maybe. Bariatric surgery. Uh, should I get a BNP? No. <laughs> Unless what? you're worried about very particular things. No. Oh, we've got one thumbs up. Uh-oh. I've never ordered one. Oh. <laughs> meh, 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 meh. What about a D-dimer? Should we get a D-dimer? Depends. Yeah. Depends. Decreases uh, CT utilization by 18%. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. When it's appropriate? Yes. Not for everybody. Okay. Should I do an LP to rule out sub arachnoid hemorrhage if the CT is negative, Diane? Depends. If the CT is less six than six hours. hours. Good. So, if, if, so the answer to oh. that is that within six hours, if the headache is abrupt onset appropriate, like sounds like a subarachnoid, negative CT within six hours of presentation, you are finished. So anything past that is a whole different story. Buprenorphine, pesky. Uh, oh, wait. This Starting is in the emergency department. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Next, next, next question. That's still a question. <laughs> Amiodarone. Actually, the Ami buprenorphine thing is like at the. There are more physicians now since this whole COVID thing started who've gotten certified. We've gotten their waivers done. It's actually kind of people are finally getting on board. It's kind of nice. Why do we need an eight-hour class when we can give all the Percodan we want or Percocet we want? We don't have a class for that. I didn't make that choice. And, yes, and, no. and on top of it, this is a really, really, really big problem. I just heard that opiate deaths, it, it seems to have kind of gotten not the news coverage that it was getting a few years ago, but opiate deaths in 2019 were higher than they ever were in, in prior years. 
it's worse now than it has been. And so this buprenorphine thing is like, I would not know why an ER wouldn't give the, have a program to give this stuff out. Transition to COVID, we've had more uh, overdose deaths in mm-hmm. Vancouver yeah. than COVID right. deaths. Well, and that's and well, less prescriptions that's, that's going out. People, that, yeah. that was my that was my to get to COVID. Well done, smooth segue. Yep. All right, um, amiodarone or, or lidocaine for arrhythmias. Choose oh, your bestie. poison. Choose your poison. Um, albuterol. Oh, this, I like this one. Albuterol inhalers. Diane, this is so up oh. your alley. <laughs> Nebs. <laughs> Nebs versus inhaler. Do your spiel because it's so no, important. Yes Although no. this, this is, um, in the time of COVID. COVID. Times. Yeah, it's COVID time. For so in slides. COVID, I think it's pretty clear. We don't nebulize anything. Um, I just, you don't want to get it out there. Puff, puff, so, puff. so you, you, put them in a puffer and you put them in an enclosed system. So the puffers and the spacers if they need to. And I, the reality is in some ERs in the country, and the, those of you from New York listening to this call, it got so bad in your ERs in New York, COVID was everywhere. It probably didn't make any difference what you did anywhere. It was in the hallways. It was in the negative ventilation rooms. It was everywhere. Um, it isn't in most emergency departments. And so I think you have to be careful not to aerosolize if you can avoid it. Um, so I think using NEBS is not a great idea, but meter dose inhalers work. They work just as well. You just have to give the right dose. So if somebody's wheezing a lot, give them a higher dose, have them do, t- do 10 puffs instead of, you know, just a nebulized dose of whatever. So yes, you can use inhalers. It's probably better to do in the time of COVID and may just make sure the dose is appropriate. It's okay to prescribe a nebulizer for home use. They can aerosolize their own house instead of yours. <laughs> just tell their family to stay out of the room. <laughs> Okay. Um, just shout out best drugs for kidney stones. Tordal. 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 Non-steroidal. Yep. <laughs> Tordal. Not lidocaine. Okay. Shout out your top number one weird zebra disease for fever of unknown origin. Oh God. Lyme um, disease. I, I had Q I fever. DVT. Hmm. DVT. Mm. Weird. Ken? I said Q fever. Oh, Sharma. I, I like the fifth disease. I know it's kind of like a rare one, not really rare, but you know, it's one of those where like fever, you know, worked up to death in a kid and then it, it goes away and then a rash, you know, you just don't know it until day four or five, but that's one of the ones that we have to think about too, is when the workup is dry and the kid who looks semi-okay. Diane. The two that I always had to put on my plate always or malaria because it's internationally the most common cause of FUO and endocarditis, which we're seeing more and more of here. Meth. They get it because they're also using most of the time. Rick. Shigella. Oh. Uh, oh yeah. Kid had a seizure about to do the lumbar puncture. This was in that generation when that happened and the, uh, Tech went to put him in a little ball, and in the process of putting him in a little ball, he <laughs> squirted out the sample that we really needed, the bloody diarrhea. Uh, that's and I gross. remember it to this day. And to be uh, a little bit of a hair splitter here, having been trained in both internal medicine and emergency medicine, fever of unknown origin is actually a diagnosis, and it has criteria. Yeah. So there's a difference between I, I have a person in the ER who has a fever, and I don't know why. And somebody who has had multiple fevers in multiple days over an extended period of time. It's a, yeah, there's a period of COVID. time. COVID. So, yeah. so it's just, they're different. So FUO is its own thing. It's a real thing. Well, yeah, COVID actually really, truly does, you know, all joking aside, made that list, right? Fever forever, it seems like. Um, Ken, I would like to take a side uh, moment to the yes, no's for you to do a demonstration of your favorite shoulder relocation. Do you have an assistant? <laughs> I, no, I don't. But, uh, but you know, I just, I like to sit across from them and do the Cunningham technique and massage that trap and gently externally rotate and distract <laughs> on a, on a, sw- on a, on a swivel chair, but I can, I can do my dermatomes. Can I do my dermatomes? <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Here we go. Ready? C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, T2, T3, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, T1. T two. Oh T three. It was it was bound to happen eventually. Everyone. Well, you know, and it, and it works better in Vegas with the sparkle lab coat. <laughs> no, it's just time to wrap does. this up. Are we going to do this COVID thing? Yeah, for like, like that's uh, yeah, COVID or five what? minutes. Five yeah, minutes. Right now I'm all blushing and red. 
so we do have like a whole bunch of new questions, which is really exciting. We'll, have, but, to put, um, we'll have to do this again, I guess. Um, let's, let's see. We currently have 226 people hanging out with us. Thank you guys so much. This has been really great to have you here. Um, we definitely want to include you in some of our future questions, but let's, let's wrap it up with some COVID stuff. Um, I want to take it all the way back to David Pecora's first question. And I'm going to bring it back up on the screen here because it's in our uh, archive section. But basically, he wanted to know um, what's going on in the ERs right now with COVID. Maybe you guys can just give a little snippet. What is life like for you? Uh, Pesky, why don't you start? I think Diane's in the, the worst thick of it at the moment. Yeah, we, we ours hit about a week ago. So I think the thing that's awful about COVID for those of us that work in emergency medicine is it's like a lava flow that you see coming mm. and it's slow and it's creeping along and you know, it's coming. And it's so last time when we had the little mini surge in California that our hospital handled it beautifully and they have a nice system that I've got a bug in here. They have a, a really nice plan, sort of a surge levels, the whole shenanigans. It's, it, they, that's been great. The problem is it's, there's a lot of people. It's not as bad as other parts of the country right now for us, but we are boarding ventilated patients in the ER. It's um, it's scary stuff. It's scary stuff. Yeah, I um, was up in North Jersey and New York um, at the beginning of all of this, and I'll never forget that. Um, I intubated more people in the span of a day than I have in my entire career, I think. Um, and um, it was bad. And that was before we knew anything at all. Um, and, you know, it comes down to the proof that so much of what we do, especially now, is driven by operations and driven by the need to make decisions based on limited information, which defines the emergency physician and the emergency practitioner that sits at the nexus of patient care, operations, public health, logistics, and has to weigh all of those things at all times, understanding that for every patient in your ER, there's another 30 in the waiting room and one of them has a STEMI or one of them has critical COVID. Um, so I think that this has been a defining moment for our specialty. Um, and I think we've risen to that occasion. Um, I think that we still have a lot to learn. Um, and all of us are going to be sort of indelibly changed because of this. All I can say is that there are people across this country, there are people who are listening right now who have either been through it. And for you, those of you who have and are on the downside, you know, I'm grateful you're on the downside, but I'm sorry you went through what you went through. And there are others who are about to face um, what it may be a defining moment of their career. And I think that what we have to say is, um, you know, you're ready. You know, you're, there's nobody more prepared for it than the emergency practitioner. There's nobody more prepared for it than the emergency practitioner that engages in education like this. I mean, come on, you've, you've self-selected as the right person to be there. Um, and uh, your patients are lucky for that. This will, uh, just to expand on that a little, this will define your career. I started my career in San Francisco in the 1980s. So if you remember what was happening in San Francisco in the 1980s, AIDS before we, it was called HTLV3. We didn't even know what it was doing or why it was doing it back then. And it really does become sort of defining you as a practitioner, how you think, what you, how you approach things. And, and you guys are on this amazing cutting edge. And the good news for the folks that are in the ERs is if you are careful, the likelihood of you getting sick during your job is low. The, the research is looking pretty good that if you wear your PPE right, it's all scary, absolutely, but do doff it correctly in particular. And as far as your own safety, you're probably fine. Take care of your emotional health, though, because I think that's harder than your physical health right now. When this really hits, I think your emotional health is the hardest part. Um, and make sure you take really, really good care of yourself. Focus on it as put it in your schedule. Like uh, write it on your calendar. I'm going to take a bath today and sit in the bathtub for 10 minutes. I'm going to go take a walk and look that their sun is actually shining. You know, do do this. It's, all, it's kind of woohoo, but it's so important right now. This idea of taking care of yourself, just vital, vital to do right now. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, you know, want to say one thing uh, in regards to that too, is uh, hospitals are, are really, I think, understanding of the fact that our mental health needs are 
they've always been there. Uh, our mental health needs and emergency medicine and, and urgent care. And we're working in the office wherever, but I think it's even more understood now by our bosses and the administration, like, Hey, these, these people are really, they're going through the ringer. So if you need a timeout, take a timeout. Um, I certainly, uh, have had the need to do that in my, in my career and there's no shame in that. So if you need a break, take a break. That's, that's how I feel about this. And that's not saying that you don't want to take care of patients. That's not saying that you can't do it, but some days, um, it's hard. It's really hard. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Well, we, we've reached our hour and a half and I want to thank all of you for your petition, patient, your insight to Martha. Thank you for coordinating the questions. And I want to thank Two guys who you don't see, um, my son Ricky and uh, his and our friend uh, Dave Pet, who are watching actually and running this thing behind the scenes. So, uh, so we can't I, I pull thank up you their for all the work that you did. Can we bring them up? They have been so amazing. Like, can we get, bring up a picture of those uh, those men? All right, show yourself, guys. Reveal. <laughs> <laughs> They're hiding. <laughs> there's Ray. Hey, there's Ray. He is. Don't know where Dave is, but there's Rick. Come on, Dave. There's Dave. Hey. Dave. hey. So they're the real brains me, behind the business. Kind of makes me want to say, what are you doing, Dave? Yeah. Dave, <laughs> what are you doing? Sorry. Uh, for all those I'm space nerds. <laughs> uh, and, and I too much, you all. But Megan, Megan has been helping filter our questions too. And she's not on video, but we have a very, you know, limited amount of people that are doing like the work of what should be like a hundred people. So they are really great. So Megan, Dave, Rick, thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye for now.